Hello, everybody. Hi, everybody. I'm Pietro Bordoletto. Thanks, everyone, for joining during lunch. What a funny time to be gathering together and talking about fertility, uh, but I appreciate everyone being here. Um, I know there's going to be people that are trickling in and out perfectly fine. I have about half an hour of stuff that I want to share with you guys. We're not going to take the full hour. I know sometimes it's just annoying to you consume your entire lunch break for this. But for those that are here and those that are joining, um, we have questions that people can ask. Drop them in the q and I'm happy to go over them. Um, and if there are no specific questions, I'm going to share with you a little bit about a topic that I feel really passionate about that I love um, in addition to surgery. I definitely love surgery, but this is kind of the other hat that I wear. I love using genetic testing to avoid passing disease on to the next generation. It's one of the most amazing uh, uses for infertility uh, treatment. I'm going to share my screen here. I'll give you a little bit of background. So this was a talk that I actually gave this morning at uh, Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center's Department of Surgery because I felt that it's important to evangelize this whole concept that we can use IVF not only to help people become pregnant, but we can also use IVF to help avoid disease in the ge next generation, which is amazing. Let me kind of walk you through a little bit about what I talked to them about. I wanted to have this audience understand what infertility is and how IVF works. I wanted to tell them a little bit about how genetic testing of embryos can be used to screen embryos. I wanted to show them a little bit about how patients show up with some of these conditions that you want to avoid, but then also talk about how IVF and genetic testing of embryos is sometimes an imperfect science. The very basics of all of this, before you talk about IVF, you have to talk about the basics of human reproduction. So the kind of the most important thing to remember is that the ovary has the eggs in it. The eggs are released and captured by the fallopian tube. The same time sperm is swimming from the vagina through the cervix into the uterus, it actually has to make its way into the fallopian tube for fertilization to occur. This is in the normal scenario, not with IVF. The egg and the sperm meet, they fertilize and they become an embryo inside the fallopian tube. And then that embryo travels into the uterus to implant. This is, this is basic. Now, the annoying parts about human reproduction is these things hopefully should all work well. But kind of the sec the first inconvenient truth about reproduction is that a woman's born with every egg she's ever going to have at birth. And that number over time will wane. It gets smaller. This happens to everyone. There's This is age-related decline. However, there are certain conditions that can speed this up and shift this curve over to the left. So sometimes inflammatory illnesses like ulcerative colitis, Crohn's, thyroid disease, these are all things that can sometimes affect the ovaries number of eggs. But then there's also just the iatrogenic decline that can sometimes happen when we do things to the ovaries. So chemo, we know is bad for the ovaries. Radiation to the pelvis, we know is bad for the ovaries. Pelvic surgery to operate on fallopian tubes or ovaries can be dangerous to the amount of eggs that you're born with. For the most part, most people are just experiencing age-related decline. Probably the most annoying part of human reproduction is that because you're born with every egg you're ever going to have at birth, these eggs age. Age-related aneuploidy is probably the hardest and most challenging thing that we try to overcome with IVF. And what I mean by aneuploidy is as your eggs get older, they become more and more likely to give an extra chromosome or keep a missing chromosome when they fuse with sperm to make an embryo. Embryos with extra or missing chromosomes in them are just not really going to give you much bang for your buck. They're not going to implant. They're not going to result in successful, healthy pregnancies. The overwhelming scenario is that embryos with abnormal DNA just won't implant and embryos um, can implant and can often miscarry early in pregnancy when they have an extra or missing DNA. There's a question here from the audience. Can the history of an eating disorder in your teens cause low AMH? You know, there's actually some data about this. Um, nutrition does play a role into ovarian aging. Um, in my experience, it's not so much that um, bulimia or anorexia, for example, affect the number of eggs that you're born with, but more so that they affect your ability to release those eggs in kind of an ordered fashion, like a, a regular menstrual period that you should be getting every month. Now, let me tell you a little bit about IVF. So IVF, it was really created to help overcome issues with infertility. 
And the primary reason for fertility in the 50s and 60s was tubal factor infertility, where the fallopian tubes were scarred, um, typically from bad inflammatory conditions like chlamydia or gonorrhea that were treated or not treated. But there was a mechanical issue where you couldn't have the egg and the sperm meet in the fallopian tube. First IVF baby was born to a woman whose mom had pelvic inflammatory disease. She could not uh, use her fallopian tubes to conceive the old-fashioned way. And this was in 1978. And really all IVF is, is augmenting the normal menstrual cycle. We're taking the hormones that the body already makes here at the beginning and giving you more of them to increase the amount of eggs that you produce. In a normal menstrual cycle, the body produces a little bit of FSH. We're going to give you injectable form of FSH at higher doses. That allows us to get your body to make lots of eggs all at once. And during the process of an IVF cycle, you're checking blood work, you're checking ultrasound, and you're just trying to make sure that things are kind of developing as expected. Because eventually, at the end of the IVF cycle, or excuse me, and this is how it kind of plays out over those 10 to 14 days. Expect injectable medications to be used. Expect blood work and ultrasound. And eventually, expect an egg retrieval. Egg retrieval is just a 20-minute procedure. It happens under light sedation. You use an ultrasound probe and a needle to go into the ovary to remove eggs. You hang around for about an hour afterwards before you're able to go home. Typically a day or two of recovery from the belly kind of being sore, bloated, and crampy. But it's a really safe procedure. Once the eggs are out of the body, this is really where the magic happens. This is where you then take sperm and fertilize the eggs in the laboratory, not in the fallopian tube, to make an embryo. And then that embryo needs to grow for about a week before you can test it, use it. And this is really where genetic testing of embryos comes online. Let me show you what an embryo looks like when it's developing. This is an embryo that's splitting from two to four cells. And then you split, see it split to eight cells. And eventually this embryo is going to become a, a structure called the morula, which kind of looks like a mulberry or a blueberry. It has lots of little scallop cells on the outside. Eventually, it's going to fill up with fluid, and this is where you have something called a blastocyst. You see the outer scallop cells on the outside that become the placenta, and then the cluster of cells all up along the wall. And then finally, you see the embryo hatching out of its shell. This is an embryo that's ready to stick somewhere. This is kind of what's happening in those seven days if you were to do time lapse during that period. The embryo has two important parts. There's the inner cell mass that becomes the fetus. And then there's the trophectoderm cells on the outside that eventually become the placenta. If you're trying to understand information about the embryo in a perfect world, you would biopsy and take cells out of the inner cell mass. But unfortunately, you can't. It hurts the embryo kind of in an irreparable way. So you have to take cells from the trophectoderm because there's lots of cells to give. And the, the embryo is a lot more forgiving when you biopsy those cells. This is what an embryo biopsy looks like use a little laser to create a rent in the shell of the embryo. And then a pipette comes up against that little hole and suctions a couple of those trophectoderm cells out. This is what allows you to take cells from the embryo and then use them for analysis. Here you can see those cells being sucked in by the pipette. And you can see as the pipette makes its way out, the cells will eventually separate and the embryo kind of stays within its shell until it's ready to hatch out of that little opening. It's a really amazing process. I'm going to pause here while this video is playing because I see some questions. Um, how much does sugar implant impact implantation when doing an embryo transfer? I think if you have underlying diabetes or if you have underlying uh, insulin resistance, all of those things can increase your risk of miscarriage. Um, so definitely good to make sure that you are not diabetic, not pre-diabetic, no evidence of insulin resistance, but having candy before afterwards uh, makes absolutely no impact on the success of the embryo transfer. Here's another question. Um, is it okay to be playing sports after embryo transfers? I currently do Pilates yoga as well, but I'm sure if pickleball is too intensive, even though I love playing. Hell yeah, play pickleball. Think about sex the old-fashioned way. You have sex and you go about your day. There's nothing that you do differently. There should be no difference with embryo transfer. I'd probably avoid going to a trampoline park, getting on a jet ski, or going horseback riding on the day of the embryo transfer. Everything else, pretty safe. Totally play pickleball. Ah, I have some other questions. My partner and I are weighing the pros and cons of PGT testing. We're both concerned it will be a sunk cost. Would this play a major role in success? I think this is one where you have to talk to your doctor. It really depends on your age and your history and kind of what's gotten you there. Um, PGT, this genetic testing of embryos, becomes most successful above the age of 37. 
but there's still kind of very unique scenarios where you may consider using it under the age of 37 and unique scenarios above the age of 37 where it may not make sense. So you have to talk to your doctor a little bit about how to individualize that. So the pre-implantation genetic testing starts with the biopsy. That's how you kind of get the information. Um, there's another question here, Kirsten, um, who's wondering, are there risks associated with embryo biopsy? Well, you just saw this video. This is can be a pretty aggressive process, right? So for the vast majority of embryos, there's no issue. For embryos that are a bit fragile um, or, or lower in quality, there is the potential that this introduces damage to that embryo and takes an embryo of from good to a little bit worse. But by and large, it depends on how often the embryologist is doing this, how good the lab is at doing this. And at Boston IVF, we do this all the time. So we have a really skilled team that knows how to do this uh, safely, effectively, and, and get a good result for us. So once you have these cells, you have to do a couple things to them. You have to break them up. You have to amplify the DNA that's in them. And then you have to sequence that DNA to then get some information about what's the makeup of the embryo. The genetic testing gives you primarily information about how many chromosomes would you expect the embryo to have. This is the most common reason why we do genetic testing. It's called PGTA, and the A stands for aneuploidy. And that allows you to find of the embryos that you have, which ones are genetically normal to use and which ones are genetically abnormal. The normal ones are the ones we use. The abnormals are the ones that we typically discard or donate to research. But you can also do genetic testing for a host of different reasons. And probably the most common reason we do genetic testing is PGTM for monogenic diseases. So if you were to be seeing your OBGYN, most OBGYNs are going to be recommending you get checked for two conditions, cystic fibrosis and spinal muscular atrophy, ideally pre-pregnancy. ACOG, our society, doesn't say that you need to check for the expanded carrier panel. The expanded means 427 different conditions, which is what Boston IVF offers that you could be tested for. Um, but if you're seeing us pre-pregnancy and you want to collect as much information as possible, um, then the expanded carrier screening is going to give you information about you and your partner um, for upwards of 427 different conditions that you may share in common beforehand. The sweet spot for this is to be done pre-pregnancy, but unfortunately, in the United States, the vast majority of pregnancies are unplanned. And the when they're unplanned, you have to find this information out in pregnancy, which can really complicate things. And this is a scenario of a patient that I've taken care of very recently who found out that who's recently pregnant. She showed up to her OBGYN. Her OBGYN offered her kind of the bare minimum cystic fibrosis and SMA testing. Patient was found to be a carrier for cystic fibrosis and she was freaked out. It doesn't matter if she's a carrier. It matters if both of them are carriers. So we also have to screen the husband. So we screened the husband and unfortunately he was also a carrier for cystic fibrosis. So this couple decided, you know what? There's a one in four chance that we're going to have a child born with cystic fibrosis. How do we find out for sure? So we can make a decision. So this patient ultimately decided to have an amniocentesis, which happens typically around 15 to 16 weeks in pregnancy, a needle procedure that brings a needle in through the abdomen, into the uterus, and into the fluid surrounding the early pregnancy, allows us to collect cells and then decide, analyze them to figure out if the fetus is affected by cystic fibrosis. Unfortunately, this was a fetus that was affected by cystic fibrosis, so the family opted to terminate the pregnancy. And ultimately, they decided to come see us, and we did the expanded carrier screening. We found out that there was nothing else that they had in common and this was a patient who decided to proceed with IVF with genetic testing, not only for the embryos to find out if they're chromosomally normal, but also to find out which embryos are affected by cystic fibrosis to avoid having those embryos used to help them build their family. We'll pause here. We have a couple more questions. How long from the first appointment with a doctor to start IVF? Oh, that's a good question. Um, insurance is typically the rate limiting step. So if you were to see me today, we would have to wait for your next menstrual period to do your testing. Testing typically happens on either the second or third day of a period, and then again between day five and day 12. Once we get that information back, we meet to review the information and decide what do we need to do. If it means IVF, we have to submit to your insurance. Most insurances in, the, in Massachusetts cover the uh, cost for IVF, but it means you have to play by their rules. So submitting to insurance can take two to four weeks. 
to hear back. And once we have approval in place and you get your period, that's when you could start an IVF cycle. So that's how long between first appointment to starting IVF. Uh, Charlie has a question about hysteroscopy. I uh, love hysteroscopy. This is not a talk about hysteroscopy, but hysteroscopy is a procedure where you use a camera to look through the cervix into the uterus to understand a little bit more about what's going on inside the uterus. Sometimes there's polyps, fibroids, scar tissue, old pregnancy tissue. Um, those are all the things that we're able to remove from a uterus using hysteroscopy, either in the office or um, in under anesthesia in an operating room. A couple of different ways to do it. Anonymous attendee, thanks so much for doing this. Where do you see patients? Ah, thank you. Thanks for being here. I see patients in person in Waltham. I see patients in person in Stoneham, but vast majority of patients I'm seeing via telehealth. Um, and if you're interested in setting up an appointment, bostonivf.com allows you to find out how to get a hold of us and be uh, eager to chat with you and figure out what's going on. All right, let me jump back into this and tell you what happened to this patient. So this patient decided to do IVF with us. He did IVF uh, for those two weeks, had those couple of visits, did the shots, the blood work, the ultrasound, and then eventually did the egg retrieval. This is what an egg retrieval looks like. So the patient's asleep. We use a needle to go into the each individual follicle, which is where the eggs are. We step on a pedal and we suck the fluid out from each follicle. And as we suck the fluid out, ideally, the eggs come out with it. And this is how we get eggs out of the ovary and from the body. Once you take eggs out, this is really where the magic starts to happen. And I think Hannah has a question. Hannah wants to know how long after pregnancy can a new egg retrieval be performed? So you can do an egg retrieval once breastfeeding is complete. The problem with doing um, an egg retrieval while you're breastfeeding is that the hormones in your body are going to go up during those two weeks. They eventually come back down. But if the hormones in your body go up, hormones can also get into the breast milk. And we don't want to expose a baby to high levels of hormones unnecessarily during an IVF cycle. So I typically tell patients, if you chose not to breastfeed or once you're done with breastfeeding, you could start another IVF cycle. This is the timeline for what the IVF cycle looks like. You're already familiar with this. Eggs come out, eggs get fertilized. We make them into embryos. And then once embryos are made, they grow for about a week. There's a question here. How many egg retrievals are considered a stopping point for further testing to happen? Not sure I understand the question, but I'm hoping I can explain it in these next couple of slides for you. So this embryo, once it's made, all of these embryos, once they're made, the very first level of screening that's done is, are the embryos genetically normal or not? That's the PGTA. The second part that happens is we have to check the embryos to see of the embryos that are normal, which ones are a carrier for cystic fibrosis? And based on how cystic fibrosis is inherited, it's a recessive condition. You have a 25% chance of having a embryo that's entirely normal, has no cystic fibrosis gene. You have a 50% chance of having an embryo that's a carrier for cystic fibrosis, just like the parents. You don't have the disease, won't have this disease, won't suffer from it, but have one copy of it that they can still pass on to their offspring. And then it's only 25% of the embryos that will have the full-blown cystic fibrosis. This is really what you're trying to find. This is the embryo that you want to avoid using for this couple. This is what an embryo transfer looks like. So bladder's full. You can see a uterus here. Once we have an embryo to use, this is what happens when it goes time to use it. We pass a little catheter through the cervix into the uterus. This is happening while you're awake in the office, kind of feels like a pap smear. But we drop off the embryo inside the uterus. You can see a little flash of light right here in a sec. That's where the embryo is kind of traveling through the catheter and being dropped off in the uterus. And then there it is. There's that flash. And then the catheter slowly makes its way out. And... Hopefully the embryo is bouncing around and finding a place it likes to, to stick. There's a question here. What's more successful, a fresh or frozen transfer, or does it not matter? Really depends on the scenario. Fresh embryo transfer is totally safe to do as long as kind of the environment you're putting the embryo in is appropriate. If sometimes hormone levels get too high, it becomes unsafe to do a fresh embryo transfer, so you don't do it because it could potentially make you sick and could potentially reduce the chances of success with the embryo. But IVF for the first 30 years of IVF was all performed fresh. It's really kind of in the last decade or so that we've really moved towards frozen embryo transfers. Um, that's because the technology for freezing and freezing them got so good. And especially if you're doing genetic testing, you have to freeze the embryo because it takes two weeks to get the information back. Mm -hmm. 
it's a good question. PCOS here. Do you see patients with PCOS who are trying to conceive? Is there a treatment protocol you recommend? Hell yeah, I see patients with PCOS. PCOS is one of my favorite conditions to treat because it's pretty straightforward. And there's a bunch of really good stuff to use from a medicines perspective, supplements perspective, lifestyle perspective um, to help people conceive either with and without IVF. Um, love taking care of patients with PCOS. So just a couple more slides for you. This is a patient who ultimately then made embryos. We put an embryo into her uterus. And if you're using a genetically tested embryo, you 10 days later, you find out if you're successful. And about 65% of the time, that embryo is going to want to implant. And if it does implant, there's going to be a less than 10% chance of miscarrying that embryo. And the reason why that chance is so low is because the number one reason why people don't get pregnant or miscarry as we get older is the chromosomal makeup of that embryo is just not normal. Embryos with extra missing chromosomes often just don't implant, and very rarely they will, but will routinely miscarry. Um, it's the rare embryo that doesn't miscarry that carries a genetic abnormality that continues into the late first and early second trimester. If you don't do PGT, does the grading matter? Yeah, the grading does matter. So the grading is a way for us when we have lots of embryos to choose from that are frozen or fresh, how do we pick which one to use first? So there's a system that's commonly used called the Gardner scale. Um, the Gardner scale gives us numbers and scores for different parts of the embryo and kind of how advanced it is. and allows us to figure out compared to the textbook, which one is the embryo that we should use first. So you try to pick the best looking one first. Once you have genetic testing information about the embryo, uh, the genetic testing really does trump a lot of that scoring of the embryo. We still use it. So if you have three genetically normal embryos, we're going to pick the best looking one. Um, but the assessing the genetics is much more um, meaningful. Fibroids and trying to conceive. I just found out I have them. Help. Well, depends where they are. So we should talk. Um, bring an ultrasound, bring an MRI. Let's meet and go over what kind of fibroids you have, where they are. And not every fibroid impacts fertility, although a lot can. And depending on where it is and what size it is, we can figure out how to remove it and get you not only feeling better, but making hopefully pregnancy a little bit more successful and safe. All right, I'm going to stop here because we have a couple more minutes and there's a bunch of questions rolling in. Let's answer some of these. Um, I was told that I have a tiny fibroid, too small for surgery. The doctor said it shouldn't impact any chance of getting pregnant. I've been trying to get pregnant, but I haven't had any luck. What should I do? Well, we should figure out where this fibroid is. Small fibroids in annoying locations can certainly impact fertility. Big fibroids definitely can impact fertility, but really it's just like real estate, location, location, location. Um, we should figure out where this fiber is and if it's worth removing. Small fibroids are pretty easy to remove if they're in the right location. It's really when they're away from the inside of the uterus that they become tougher and a lot less meaningful. Um, so we should probably review that with you. Here's another question. 33-year-old female, 36-year-old male with unexplained infertility going on my third embryo transfer. What could I be doing differently to help my chances? You know, that's don't have enough information about you to help understand why. I think you'd have to really kind of dig into that with your doctor. There's a bunch of different reasons why good embryos don't implant. Most common one being the genetic makeup of the embryo, but it also the environment in the uterus really does matter in kind of the hormonal environment in which you're putting the embryo in. So a lot to dig into there. We'd really have to kind of check that out. Um, here's a longer question. Um, eight years ago, when my wife was in her early 20s, a doctor recommended my wife consider tubal ligation. It was after a series of rejected IUDs, two separate pulmonary embolisms from birth control. Two years later, my wife and I met, and now we're considering having kids. Doctor told her she's self-sterilized and saying just having a conversation about IVF will cost us $400. Do we have any alternatives? Uh, we we're concerned about a reversal because of her history of PEs. So all good questions. There's a lot to unpack here. Once tubes are tied, you absolutely need IVF to be able to conceive if you're unwilling to try to reverse the tubes. There are procedures that are sometimes effective to help take out where the tubes are cut and try to reattach the tubes. Not a lot of surgeons do it. It's expensive and not covered by insurance, but also in this scenario, IVF would not be covered by insurance either since there was a sterilization procedure. So it's either surgery to reverse the fallopian tubes um, and you'd have to meet with someone who does the surgery to go over that in detail or using IVF. 
Here's a question about tubes. What if I have a blocked fallopian tube? That's why IVF was invented. IVF was invented to overcome issues with blocked fallopian tubes. Um, it's probably the, the, the best use of IVF. Um, from your experience, do you find that warming the uterus helps with success? Absolutely not. Not a thing. Um, I think that is a totally made up bogus thing and I would not warm the uterus. Uh, I've been reading in Chinese medicine that this is common. I stick to the evidence. I think if it's been studied before and it's shown to be effective in multiple different patient populations, sure. But if it's an anecdote, I try to avoid it. Uh, I think patients with fertility and infertility issues just have two are kind of constantly getting bombarded with both good information and bad information. And I think this is an example of bad information. Don't warm your uterus. If you have an abnormally shaped uterus, does that make it harder to get pregnant and stay pregnant? Ah, yes. Uh, for example, shape defined as arcuate or bicornuate. Arcuate or bicornuate are two entirely different kinds of abnormalities in the uterus. Arcuate is probably normal. That's when you have a little bit of a speed bump at the top of your uterus. Bicornuate is a totally different beast. Bicornuate means that you likely had two uteruses that were forming independently from each other and never became a single solid uterus. These are a host of conditions called malarian anomalies that absolutely can impact fertility and can uh, increase your chances of miscarriage and create trouble for you to not only get pregnant, but stay pregnant for sure. We should talk. Malarian anomalies are one of my favorite things. How do you know when it's time to take a break? Gone through two IUIs, one egg retrieval and multiple transfers. I can't decide if it's worth giving my body a break or just keep pushing through to get better eggs while I'm younger-ish. I'm sorry that you've gone through so much. Um, IVF really, infertility can really be a journey. In the perfect world, it's short and direct, but in a more realistic world, it can take lots of twists and turns. I think it really depends on your age um, and what's going on. I think if you're 42, 43, 44, probably shouldn't be taking a break. It's either kind of keep going or stop altogether. I think if you're younger and have the benefit of time and need the mental break, much more reasonable, but it really kind of depends on what's going on in that time and, and what the trajectory looks like. It's a good question. I have time for probably two or three more questions. We're going to log off here in the next two, three minutes. Um, wanted to thank everyone for logging in during the lunch break. I know it's kind of a awkward to log into these things where you're sometimes at work or on the go, but thanks for being here. Um, if you have questions beyond these kind of 30 minutes together, I'm happy to, to meet, do a consultation and tell you a little bit more about what I know about fertility, but also kind of review your information in detail. You can log on to bostonivf.com and it'll give you information for calling and scheduling a new patient. And I see patients in Stoneham, I see patients in Waltham, but really see a lot of patients via telemedicine because it's just so darn convenient. All right, 10 second countdown. If there are no final questions, we'll... Uh, let everyone go and get everyone back to their day. All right, that's 10 in my mind. Thanks everyone. Um, thanks for being here. Thanks for the great questions. Thanks Hannah and Kirsten for being here. Um, we'll see all of us, all of each other very soon. Bye.